I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, and this is Ask Dave, episode 16. I'm here to answer your questions about ham radio, especially questions of interest to those new to the hobby. Today's question comes from Dan, KG7YVG, and Dan, thanks for your question. He asks, I would like to get some advice on troubleshooting reception issues. When signals are faint on HF, how should I go about identifying the cause? When do I know it's simply a lack of propagation? How do I know my antenna is at fault or the feed line? Or what if my transmitter is insufficient or defective? This question takes me back to when I set up my first HF station. I had just graduated from BYU and was a novice, so I wanted a CW station. I brought home with me a Heathkit AT1 transmitter that I was assured worked, a single crystal, and a Radio Shack Realistic DX150 receiver. I tried all sorts of things, but got nowhere. As a new ham and completely without a mentor, I didn't know what to do. So I figured I'd better start with something I knew would work. I set aside the AT1 and built a Heathkit HW16. I got a commercially built vertical antenna, the high gain 14 AVQ, an antenna that's still sold today, and mounted the antenna on the chimney. I ran some tuned radials according to the instructions. There were no pre-built coax cables in those days, so I carefully soldered connectors to the inexpensive RG58 coax I got at Radio Shack. I still had troubleshooting to do, but got everything to work and was able to operate. The HW16 was a simple radio with minimal controls, so I didn't have too much opportunity to get things mixed up. So here's the moral of that story. Start out with a station setup in which you have a high degree of confidence. To this day, I recommend that newcomers to HF start with a simple rig so that there are far fewer knobs to set in the wrong direction. I also recommend that newcomers start with a new radio rather than a used one because used radios can have quirks that might be easy for an experienced ham to overcome, but which might baffle a newcomer. To address Dan's question more directly, there are a number of things that can affect HF reception. Let's start with the station itself. This diagram shows a typical HF reception chain. Let's go through it step by step. First, the antenna. You've likely situated it as best you can. Make sure the connections are properly tight. If you've made a dipole yourself, you may have soldered the coax to the antenna elements. That's good. Or in commercially available antennas, you may have attached the coax, which should be finger tight. Any screw terminals connecting to antenna elements should be clean and tight. And then it should all be waterproofed. Next, let's consider the feed line. Before you first put the feed line in place, use a simple multimeter to check for continuity on both the outer braid and the inner conductor and be sure that the two aren't shorted to each other. Check for places where the coax might be pinched or mechanically damaged. Note that certain animals such as chipmunks and squirrels seem to have an affinity for chewing on coax cables. Let's look at the receiver itself. The antenna tuner might be part of your receiver or it might be separate. For now, let's bypass it by turning it off or actually taking it out of the system. Now, most receivers have a front end attenuator of some sort to help deal with signal overload. Often it's a single attenuator of about 20 dB. Make sure this attenuator is set to off, that is zero dB. If it's accidentally on, it can make everything seem pretty faint. You'll rarely have to use the attenuator. It's there in case there's a strong signal that causes problems with the input stages. Next comes the RF gain control. The RF gain control actually controls gain for the IF stages as well. Note, and this is important, 
For most of your work, this control should be turned all the way on, yes, to the max. Note on some radios that combine an RF gain control with a squelch, the max RF gain might be at the 12 o'clock position, but on most radios you should turn it all the way clockwise and leave it there. There are some situations, again with very strong stations, when you might want to back it off, but for now, leave it all the way on. Note that your receiver automatic gain control, or AGC, will adjust the RF gain for you in the presence of a strong signal. Next come the filters. On some radios, the filter bandwidth is tied to the mode, but on others it can be set independently. Be sure the filter is set wide enough to capture the signal you want. Use the 3 kHz position or something close to that for single sideband. If you have a narrower filter, such as the common 600 Hz used for CW, it will greatly distort a voice signal. If you have a narrower filter, such as the common 600 Hz used for CW, it will greatly distort a voice signal. Anything below about 3 kHz is for modes other than voice. Next in our chain is the detector mode. Be sure this is set for the mode you want to hear, which will likely be lower sideband or upper sideband. In general, frequencies above 10 MHz are upper sideband, and those below are lower sideband. The only exception to this is the 60 meter band, which is upper sideband. If you have the mode control set improperly, you'll hear garbage. In particular, if it's set to AM, you won't hear any CW signals and all voice signals will be indecipherable. The last in the chain is the audio frequency amplifier controlled by the AF gain control. I have a V here because sometimes this is simply called volume. Use this to set a comfortable listening level. I prefer headphones because they put the sound right in the center of my head where it's easier for my brain to process, but some operators prefer the loudspeaker. So is that enough? Usually it is. Note that a quick way to tell if your receiver is working is to compare the noise coming from your receiver in the case when no antenna is connected to the case where it is. You should hear a definite jump in receiver noise when connecting the antenna. Let me demonstrate with this simple 40 meter QRP radio. It puts out some noise even without an antenna. But when I touch the antenna to the input connector, the background noise jumps. That's because the HF bands are quite noisy, even with no signals. Propagation itself will determine what you can hear. Under normal conditions, the sun's ultraviolet rays cause ionization in the upper atmosphere, giving rise to layers with names such as D, E, and F. The signal from the transmitting station is refracted in the ionosphere and bent back down to the receiving station, namely you. But the sun isn't a nice, stable thing. There's something called the solar wind, which consists of all sorts of particles, many charged, that simply blow away from the sun toward us. This constant stream of charged particles affects the ionosphere. Further, you may have seen videos of the sun that show it as a constantly roiling storm. Every so often the sun burps coronal mass ejections into space. These mass ejections, when they hit the Earth, cause a geomagnetic storm. This greatly affects the ionosphere, usually adversely. If there's a geomagnetic storm in progress, it can essentially kill the ionosphere's ability to refract radio waves. This results in a communications blackout on HF frequencies. By the way, periods of geomagnetic storms are often accompanied by an increase in polar aurora. Now, let's suppose you have everything set up and the station has been working well. But suddenly one day you don't hear much at all. Your CQs go unanswered.
It could very well be because of a geomagnetic storm. How can you tell? Well, the government agency called NOAA looks at many things beside the latest rainstorms. It also follows and predicts so-called space weather. This NOAA webpage addresses radio communications and is reached from the NOAA.gov homepage by selecting dashboards and then the radio communication dashboard. There's lots of interesting stuff here. Of primary interest in terms of blacking out HF communications is the level of geomagnetic activity, here shown as minimal, therefore having minimal effect on propagation. But if the band conditions seem to be simply terrible, check back here. You'll likely find much higher levels of geomagnetic activity. It can sometimes take several days for a storm to pass. A general rule of thumb is that once you have your station working and you've used it, if something goes wrong, it's most often just one thing. Understanding the signal chain, which is affected by propagation and your radio settings, helps to find and fix the problem. As you gain experience, you'll head right for the correct cause more quickly. Oh, one more thing. For years, folks have been asking for the training videos on DVD. I've resisted, preferring that people use YouTube. But now I've put the Technician series on DVD. It takes three DVDs to the set, and I'm selling each set for $30, which covers duplicating, handling, and free shipping anywhere in the United States. These are the videos originally made for version two of the license manual, but because the ARRL did not change the outline of version three, the videos continue to be valid. You can get the DVDs on my website at ke0og.net. This week's picture again comes with a story. It was taken at the Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. That's me there, kneeling down to get a closer look at the handprints, footprints, and wand prints of the three stars of the Harry Potter movie series. I've enjoyed the entire Harry Potter phenomenon, so much so to drive to Hollywood from Griffith Park just to see this particular piece of concrete. That wraps up episode 16 of Ask Dave. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel to get notification of future videos. You can ask me questions either by commenting on this video or using the Ask Dave question form on my website at ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. I've also got a tip jar both on my YouTube channel page and on my website. I'm about two weeks away from hitting one million lifetime YouTube views, and every month viewers watch over 6,000 hours of my videos. I greatly appreciate your support and enthusiasm for these videos. Remember, the Ask Dave series is for you. Until we meet next, 73.